In this video, we're going to be talking about one of the most neglected chapters in Introduction to Economics. We will be talking about the oligopoly market structure. In fact, it is one of the easier chapters that we've seen in this unit. So let's go through some of the concepts um, of this market structure. And the first thing that we always do is to talk about what are the determinants of this particular market structure. The first determinant is the number of agents in this market. So there are going to be a few sellers serving many, many buyers in the market. So when we talk about few buyers, let's be a little bit more specific about it. For the purpose of introduction economics, we're only going to be talking about two sellers in this market, and we call that a duopoly. The second determinant would be imperfect information as well as mobility. So what this means for the buyers is that they do not know what are the different prices that firms can charge at and they don't know what are the firm's cost structures as well. The firms know their own cost structures. Um, they might know the other firm's cost structure but they are not very sure on what is um, the exact strategy and the exact thing that other firms would do. Um, the market also has a homogeneous or a differentiated good. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but what matters is that it has got high barriers to entry to keep it at only two firms. Okay, So high barriers to entry could be a result of um, these two firms having very big economies of scales, either they've got patents or they're very advanced in a technology that nobody can copy that stuff and that's why they can't enter the market. So with these four determinants, uh, we can see that the oligopoly market or the duopoly actually has got very high market power and it can control the price um, to a certain extent. But what is so special about the oligopoly market that we have to take note of? Now, the key differentiating factor uh, that differentiates oligopoly from perfect competition and monopolistic comp, which you will see in the later videos, is actually this thing called strategic planning. Okay, now why, does, why is there strategic planning in a market where there's only two firms? Well, that's because each of these two firms are actually large, right? And they are large enough to affect certain uh, market conditions. And when I mean market, what, when I say market conditions, what I mean is things like the equilibrium price as well as the equilibrium quantity. So these are the conditions that can be affected by each firm's behavior. Therefore, the competing firms in this market will have to be very, very aware of the other firm's behavior. Okay, so they have to be very aware of the other firm's behavior and they must also respond appropriately according to how the other firm is behaving. Now, perfectly competitive firms, they react, right? They don't respond, they react. So PC firms react to things like market price. So when there's a change in the market price, PC firms will actually change the quantity produced. Now, um, a, a good way to remember this is that um, there needs to be a lot of responsibility in the duopoly market. And um, responsibility can also be defined as the ability to respond. Respond to who? Respond to what the other firm is doing. Okay, so you guys are competing, you have to understand what the other guy is doing. So over here at Quick Economics, we love sports very much. So I'm going to use two different sports to illustrate the difference between a perfect competitive market as well as a dual poly. So imagine that a perfect comp is actually a 100 meter race, whereas a dual poly is actually a boxing match. So to win a 100 meter race, you just have to be the fastest man or woman okay, on the running track, right? Finish the 100 meters in the shortest amount of time, you win. To win in a boxing match, you basically have to knock out your opponent, right? If you don't knock your opponent out, you're going to be knocked out. So what do you think is the strategy for these two types of sports? Now, if I was a 100 meter sprinter, I would basically train as hard as I can, right? I'll keep running and running until I become the fastest that I can be. So I'll just give it my 100% um, every day at training and that's going to be as fast as I can, okay? So regardless of what my other competitors are doing, I am going to train as hard as I can. Okay, so, so this is the strategy for a 100 meter race, right? For a boxing match, does it mean that if you can throw the hardest punch, you're going to win? Well, what if you miss the punch, right? Or, you know, what if you, you, you throw your hardest punch, but your opponent is still standing? For those of us who have a little bit of experience with martial arts, I think you would know that if you were to throw your hardest punch, or maybe even the hardest kick, and if you're going to miss, you are actually going to be very vulnerable because um, you might have exposed certain weak parts of yourself, right? So if let's say I threw a hook, which is really, really my hardest hook, and I miss, I might be exposing parts of my midsection, which my opponent can very, very easily just counter, give me a counter attack. 
So that's why throwing the hardest punch, you know, might not make me win this boxing match. So putting that into consideration, I can also focus on being the fastest guy in the ring. So the question is, which one do I focus my training on? So how I prepare myself for the fight actually depends on my opponent. Okay, so there are different kinds of people you can fight. You can fight a guy that's big but slow, but you can also fight a guy that's small but fast at the same time. So you see a boxing match is really similar to how a dual poly market, uh, market structure operates. So that is why there needs to be some form of strategic planning uh, when there are two firms competing with one another. You see it's a game. Okay, all this is just a game. And that brings me to the next branch of this mind map. We're going to be talking about game theory. Okay, so game theory uh, is defined as the study of strategic decision making. Let me use an example that most people can actually relate to. Let's talk about the United States of America and the Soviet Union deciding on whether they should have nuclear weapons or not. So both of these countries have got two different options, right? So they can either build the nuclear weapons or they can not build the nuclear weapons. So the question now is how do both countries decide? You see, if I'm going to build nuclear weapons, I'm going to be covering my ass in case we go to war, right? I can just simply fire my warhead and then the war is over. At the same time, if I don't build the nuclear weapon, we can have world peace. So which one do I want? So history shows that both the US and the USSR actually built their own nuclear weapons, right? So that is what we call the Nash Equilibrium. The Nash Equilibrium is for both countries to adopt the strategy of building their own nuclear weapons. Okay, so let's talk about what is a Nash Equilibrium. So the Nash Equilibrium is actually a steady state. A steady state of what? It is a steady state whereby a set of strategies chosen by two parties and when I say strategies, I'm referring to either building a nuclear weapon or not building a nuclear weapon. And the two parties cannot benefit and they cannot gain by changing their strategy. Now that we know what a Nash equilibrium is, I need you to know that there are actually many types of games. But for the purpose of introduction to economics, we will only be talking about one type of game in this video. So the rules of the game is as such. This game is a simultaneous game, and what I mean is that two players are going to make their moves together. So they're going to move at the same time, or appear to move at the same time. So this is different from what we call a sequential game. A sequential game is basically you go first and I go next, right? So this is not like a game of chess, okay? There are no ticking turns in here. Another rule is that this is a one-time game. And what I mean by one time is that there is only one round. Okay, there's only one round for us to play this game. So this is different from a repeated game. Okay, a repeated game basically means, of course, there are more than one rounds. And uh, repeated games can come in either limited rounds or unlimited rounds. Okay, but we're not going to be talking about repeated games today. This is just for your um, general knowledge. And I'm going to show you that the result of this particular game is the Prisoner's Dilemma. Now, the prisoner's dilemma is not a type of game. It is a result of a certain game. Now, what is the prisoner's dilemma? It is basically the case where there are two parties okay, that do not cooperate with each other, even when it's better to cooperate. I'm sure you might be wondering why two parties would not want to cooperate even if they knew that it was better to do so. In order to explain this to you, we're going to need to spend some time doing some storytelling. This is Dick and Tom. They are part of a criminal gang which robbed one of the biggest banks in the country. They managed to get away on the day of the robbery, but about a month later, both Dick and Tom were arrested by the special police force and thrown into prison. While awaiting for their criminal charges, Dick and Tom were placed in separate prison cells. There is something that I need to remember from this story. First, there is no way Dick and Tom can communicate with each other because they have been placed in different prison cells. And coincidentally, the police do not have enough evidence to charge both Dick and Tom for being culprits of the robbery that happened a month ago. So the police had an idea to close the case. What they could do is to actually get one of the guys to testify in court against the other guy so that they can just close the case. That's pretty sneaky if you ask me. 
So there can be three different outcomes from this scenario here. Let's look at the case where both A and B, which is Dick and Tom, they remain silent. The police have decided that if none of them decides to testify against the other guy in court, then both of them will just get one year in jail, as uh, maybe they are just suspects, right? So they just get one year in jail. Um, and let's look at the case where both A and B, Dick and Tom, betray one another. So if they both betray one another, um, what happens is that both Dick and Tom will serve three years in prison. And we have the last kind of case is where one party betrays another. So let's say A betrays B and B chooses to remain silent. So what happens in this case is that A is going to spend zero years in prison and B is going to spend five years in prison. So now the question is, what would Dick and Tom choose? Would they choose to betray the other guy or would they choose to remain silent? So in order to analyze this, we're going to need to use a payoff matrix, which we also call the normal form of analyzing a game. Um, the other kind of form is called the extensive form, uh, but we're not going to talk about that in this video. Okay, We're just going to use the normal form. Okay, So I'm going to be drawing um, this thing called the payoff matrix. So on this side, I'm going to put Dick, and on the top over here, I'm going to put Tom. Okay, so both Dick and Tom have got two very different strategies. We know that Dick can choose to betray Tom or choose to remain silent. At the same time, we know that Tom can choose to betray Dick or remain silent as well. So if both Dick and Tom choose to betray, then Dick will get three years in prison. Okay, and Tom is going to get three years as well in prison. So the first number we refer to Dick's payoff and the red number, the second number, we will be referring to Tom's payoff. Now if both of them choose to remain silent, both of them are going to get one year in prison each. So if Dick chooses to remain silent and Tom betrays him, Dick gets five years and Tom is going to get zero years. Now if Tom remains silent and Dick betrays him, Dick gets zero years and Tom gets five years. So that is how we express this game in the normal form, using a payoff matrix. Let's focus on Dick. Okay, let's look at how Dick is going to make his decisions. Now, if Tom is going to betray Dick, what do you think Dick would want to do? Well, if you look at Dick's payoffs, he's better off getting 3 years than 5 years, so he would choose to move up from being silent, and he would choose to betray. Well, now, if Tom chooses to remain silent, what do you think Dick is going to do? So let's look at this column over here and compare 0 and 1. Would Dick prefer 0 years in prison or 1 year in prison? Well, obviously he's going to prefer 0 years in prison, so he's not going to remain silent. Instead, he's going to choose to betray Tom. Now, let's focus on Tom. Let's say Tom thinks that Dick is going to betray him. So what is Tom going to do if that's the case? Well, compared 3 years and 5 years, I think Tom would prefer to serve only 3 years. Therefore, he will not remain silent and he would choose to betray Dick. Now, let's say Tom thinks that Dick is going to remain silent. So what is Tom going to do? Now, if you compare 0 years and 1 year, of course Tom would prefer to have 0 years in prison than 1 year, right? So Tom will again choose to betray Dick and not remain silent. As you can see, no matter what happens, Dick will always choose to betray Tom. That makes it his dominant strategy and Tom will always choose to betray Dick, which makes it his dominant strategy as well. So this green box over here is what we call the Nash equilibrium. So what we say is that the Nash equilibrium is for both Dick and Tom to betray each other. As you can see, the Nash equilibrium is also the box which does not have any arrows in it. So this is how you solve a game using the payoff matrix. Now, if you notice this box over here, which has got arrows in it, therefore it's not chosen as the Nash equilibrium, don't you think that both of them spending one year in prison is much better than both of them spending three years in prison? Well, of course, right? So this is where you can see that it is actually better for them to cooperate. And this is actually what we call your Pareto efficient um, point, right? But uh, we go through Pareto efficient um, in, in, in the future, but uh, this is clearly a case whereby you've got two parties that don't cooperate 
even if it's better to cooperate. And this is called the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, let's move on to the last branch of this mind map. We're going to be talking about a mathematical approach to the dual poly. Okay, so the purpose of uh, doing the mathematical approach is to actually show you the mechanism of how a dual poly works. Let's talk about a basic setup for this. So, we have a market demand function, um, a very simple one. It's P equals to A minus beta times quantity. So this quantity is actually the total quantity of firm 1 and firm 2 producing in the market. And the cost function for each firm is simply going to be 0. Okay, we'll make it very simple. This is a major assumption. So your marginal cost of each firm is actually constant and 0 at all levels. And finally, another assumption is um, these two firms are going to be competing on quantity, which means that they compete on each, uh, with each other by choosing um, Q1E and Q2E. The E there stands for equilibrium, right? And they're going to make their moves simultaneously, and this is known as a Connor game, okay? Um, there are many different types of games to which you will learn um, in a second year of study. So the objective here is to find the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantities of firm 1 and firm 2, okay? So uh, let's take a look at firm 1 first. So every firm has the objective of maximizing their profits. So you need to write down the profit function of firm 1. So that's revenue minus zero cost. And you have to replace P with the demand function. Take note that the Q is actually Q1 plus Q2 because that's a total market demand. So I'm going to expand the bracket out and then I'm going to differentiate this profit function with respect to Q1 because I'm maximizing the profits and I'm choosing Q1 to maximize those profits, right? So I'm going to get this equation over here, and I'm going to add E to the superscript of Q1 to show that this is the equilibrium output, right? So I'm going to solve for Q1 superscript E, and this uh, bunch of alphabets here is known as firm 1's best response function, right? It's a best response because they are maximizing their profits, but they are not sure what is firm 2 going to do. So let's look at firm 2. Again, we're going to take the, the, the profit function, okay, which is the price multiplied by the quantity. Quantity, again, is determined by the demand function as you see over there. Okay, and of course, minus zero cost. So I'm going to maximize the equation again by differentiating with respect to Q2. And I'm going to put E on top of Q2 to show that, yes, this is going to be the equilibrium for firm 2, and that's how much they're going to be producing. All right? So... Q2E is going to equal to this bunch of gibberish that you see over here. It looks pretty similar to Q1E, don't you think? So this over here is known as firm number 2's best response function. So in a dual poly, there's going to be some strategic planning, right? So to find a Nash equilibrium, what you need to consider that in firm 1's perspective, he knows that firm 2 is going to be maximizing their profits. So Q2 would be equals to the profit maximizing Q2. And also in firm number 2's perspective, he knows that firm 1 is going to maximize his profits. Therefore, he knows that Q1 is going to be equal the profit maximizing Q1. So Q1E is actually a function of Q2E and Q2E is a function of Q1E. What you got to do is just substitute Q2 with Q2E and substitute Q1 with Q1E. So I think you can easily see that what you need to do next is to simultaneously solve both of the best response functions. I would suggest you doing the math by yourself to practice and what you'll notice is that Q1E is actually the same as Q2E and it is equals to one third of A over B. Okay, so if you solve it correctly, this should be the number. Okay, now let's look at what is the equilibrium price. So I'm going to substitute Q1E and Q2E into the demand function and I'm going to get a market equilibrium price of one third A. So I'm going to need to take note of one third alpha over beta and one third alpha. Okay, so that is the profit maximizing output for both firms as well as the market price. Now, let me take you to the graph. Okay, so this is the demand function which I just mentioned earlier. Okay, and the marginal cost for both firms 
is going to be a straight line across the x-axis because it's equal to zero. So that is constant marginal cost. Now, point A over here is the perfect competitive equilibrium, right? Because that is where P equals to MC. So to solve the quantity for point A, basically I just have to substitute zero into the uh, price of the demand function and I'm going to get Q equals to alpha over beta. So that is the size of the market, it's the total market size, okay? So each firm is going to supply one third of the market. I'm pretty sure this is familiar to you if you have read the subject guide. So that is how the one third is being derived, okay? So we know that both of them are going to be supplying a total of two thirds, which gives us the price of one over three A, okay? So that is the market price over there. So this over here is the consumer surplus, and the rectangle below is the producer surplus for both firm 1 and firm 2. And what you've got is actually date weight loss. So the conclusion here is that the dual poly market, if they compete on quantity simultaneously, is an inefficient market. And that actually brings me to the end of this video on oligopoly. We want to thank you for studying with Quickonomics. Creating this video has given us the urge to go for some kickboxing lessons. And to the next video, we'll see you around.